Alone in my sorrow and dead in my sin Lost without hope of no place to begin Your love made a way to let mercy come in When death was arrested and my life began Ash was redeemed, only beauty remains And my orphan heart was given a name My morning grew quiet, my feet rose to dance When death was arrested and my life began everybody a happy Easter and we miss our church family so bad and can't wait for everybody to get back and be together. Happy Easter. Happy Easter. Happy Easter. Happy Easter. For if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come, the old has gone, and the new is here. Easter is very important to me. It's a second chance. Happy Easter to our church family. You're all extra special. Happy Easter. To all our church family. He is risen. Happy Easter! Happy Easter! Happy Easter! Hallelujah! He's not here. The tomb is empty. He's risen! Happy, Happy Easter, Easter, everyone! From our house to your He is risen! Laid on the criminal's cross the Darkness rejoiced as though heaven had lost But then Jesus arose with our freedom in him Verses 12 to 14 says, What do you think? If a man has a hundred sheep and one of them goes astray, does he not leave the ninety-nine and go to the mountains to seek the one that is straying? And if he should find it, assuredly I say to you, he rejoices more over that sheep than over the ninety-nine that did not go astray. Even so, it is not the will of your Father who is in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. Happy, Happy Easter. Easter. Happy Easter from Bobby and Jan Thomas. Hope everyone has a great day. Happy Easter from the Thomases at Bay Springs. We hope everyone has a wonderful Easter and indeed he is risen. Be safe everyone and can't wait to see and be back with all of us. Love my Fulton United Methodist Church family. God bless. Happy Easter. Happy Easter.
come to our Easter service, April the 12th, 2020. We ask you to join with us in prayer as we pray our colleague for today. Almighty God, through the rising of Jesus Christ from the dead, you've given us a living hope. Keep us joyful in all our trials and guard our faith so that we may receive the wonderful inheritance of life eternal which you have prepared for us through Jesus Christ our Lord. Let his church say, Amen. And God is good all the time, and all the time God is good. We have a few announcements for you this Sunday morning. First of all, we want to say thank you to uh, all of those who make this service possible. And uh, Jenny and Doug Jenkins, uh, Becky Carston, and Emily Quinn, who uh, is uh, filming and helping us out in so many different ways. Yesterday, she conducted an egg hunt uh, for our children, and I hope your children all participated and were, were blessed through uh, uh, those efforts. We also want to say thank you to all of you who, through this terrible pandemic we've been going through that have been supporting your church. Not just through prayers, but also those, those uh, other ways that we support the church with our prayers and our gifts and our services. We thank you and those individuals who have uh, pr practicing bank drafts and people dropping checks off at the church. We appreciate it. Now with the men. Thank you so much for that and thank you about your church. We uh, Remind you that every evening at 6 o'clock, we want to ring our bells and our churches and, uh, and, and be in prayer for those first responders that are throughout our, our nation, and especially in Mississippi. Our lieutenant governor has asked us to do this. And if you don't have a chimes in your church, you can ring a, ring a bell, or you can ring your doorbell, or you can blow your horn of the car, or you can, or by all means, say a prayer. Say a prayer. We also want to announce to you that next, next Saturday, uh, the 18th, we're going to be having our food pantry as scheduled as usual. So uh, there are people out there that even though we're in the midst of a, of, of a terrible uh, a pandemic, there are still people who are hungry and need uh, this, uh, this support. So if you can help, if you can help, we're going to wear the gloves, we're going to wear masks, we're going to uh, 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 try to uh, help the folks out that need boxes through uh, uh, next Saturday as usual. So if you can help that Saturday morning, the boxes will be packed, just ready to distribute. We'd appreciate you, you helping us. Here's another bit of information we want to share with you about the Methodist Church. Many of you know that our church is a conferencing church. We have our conferences that we go, go through, go to. John Wesley uh, recommended that we, we conference regularly and join together. Well, a few conferences have been postponed temporarily. Let me share those with you. General conference, as you may know, it would, was scheduled for May. It has been temporarily postponed. General Conference of the United Methodist Church. The Mississippi Annual Conference that was scheduled for uh, June has also been postponed. It's been uh, uh, temporarily postponed, as well as the jurisdictional uh, annual con uh, jurisdictional conference, which uh, all the jurisdictions, this is southeastern jurisdiction we're a member of, all of them meet at the same time in July. That one has been postponed as well. So, uh, this is just to keep all of you safe that would be going to conference and conferencing and, uh, and, and keep all of our churches safe as well. We'll let you know the information as we find out more information uh, about uh, the conference. Again, there's a lot of things that are, are going on. We appreciate all of the things that are, you are doing at home and by way of uh, worshiping and reading your Bible and studying. Many people have told me they've resumed reading their Bibles and some of you have concluded even the New Testament in the last few, uh, few 
few weeks, and that's just wonderful. We appreciate all that you're doing. So at this time, we would like to uh, go to God in a word of prayer as we remember. This is a special prayer uh, from the book of worship for those who care for us. So let us uh, go to God in prayer. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, who has power over life and death, over health and sickness, give us strength, wisdom, gentleness to thy ministering servants, those first responders, the medical staff, people who work in grocery stores, restaurants, the people who drive the uh, trucks, all physicians and surgeons, nurses, watchers by the sick, that always bearing thy presence with them, they may only heal but also bless in service as lamps of hope in the darkest hours of distress and fear. We ask this through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. And in His name, let us all say, Amen. And now we ask you to join with us as we affirm our faith with historical words that we, confession of faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born to the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day He arose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From then she shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
The scripture is the 20th chapter of the Gospel of St. John. The story of the resurrection of Jesus. Mary's weeping. We, she's weeping initially and tra- because of tragedy. And then, as the story unfolds, she weeps in triumph. Let's read the scripture. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved. And they have said, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they've laid him. Then Peter and the other disciples set out and went toward the tomb. The two were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent down and looked in and saw the linen wrappings lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came, following him, and went into the tomb. He saw the linen wrappings lying there and the cloth that had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen napkins, but rolled up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple, who reached the tomb first, also went in and saw and believed. For, as of yet, they did not understand the scriptures that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples returned to their homes. But, Mary stood weeping outside the tomb, and as she wept, she bent over it and looked into the tomb and saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had been lying, one at the head and the other at the feet. They said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? And she said to them, They've taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they've laid him. When she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there. But she did not know that it was Jesus. And Jesus said unto her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you looking for? And supposing him to be a gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Hebrew, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, Do not hold on to me because I have not yet ascended to my Father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and to your Father, and to my God and to your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. And she told them, that he had said these things to her. This is the word of God for the people of God, and thanks be to God. Now, never has there ever been a more tender hearted person to live than Jesus. Kind, loving, generous, giving in every way imaginable. When crowds came to him asking for help, he complied. When Mary and Martha asked them to give them aid, when their brother had died, Jesus did. He raised the brother from the dead. When a hungry multitude on the north shore of the Sea of Galilee were hungry, Jesus took the lunch of a little boy, fish and bread, and fed the multitude. At the opening of his ministry, his mother and Jesus was at a wedding, and they ran out of wine, and his mother said, Jesus can take care of this, and he turns the water into wine. All through his earthly ministry, Tenderhearted, compassionate, very loving. And on the cross, when he's dying for your sins and mine, he looks down from the cross and he says to this multitude, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. For some people, death itself 
is the greatest fear they have in life. But some have learned that there may be things even worse than death. One of the things may be the effect that that death may have on people that you love. Or your death might have on people that love you. John Arthur tells a story in his book entitled Death Be Not Proud of a young medical student, a young lady has so much to look forward to. Brilliant, lovely young lady. And she's diagnosed with an incurable disease. And as the doctor is telling her this tragic news, breaking the doctor's heart, the only thing the young lady could say was, how are we going to tell mother and daddy? Notice, notice what her concern was. She was concerned about her own mortality for sure, but her greatest fear was the effect that that was having on people that she loved. I'm very careful to say, to never say Jesus tried to do anything. Because he always did it. He was quite successful. But if there's one incident in the scripture where he tried to tell the disciples about what was going to happen to him. And it seems that they never really absorbed this during the three years. It seems that they never comprehend this fact that when even you tear this temple down and in three days I'll rebuild it, it'll come back. They don't seem to get this, this very important message that the Son of Man must be crucified and on the third day rise from the dead. He proclaimed that many times, but they never seemed to grasp the full impact of it. After his death, they hurt. And Jesus hurt for them. And as a matter of fact, this is the effect that it had on them. When Mary Magdalene tells them what she has experienced the resurrection morning, and a couple of them go to the tomb. As they get back, this is what they say. Verses 9 and 10 of the scripture you just read. Listen to this. For as of yet they did not understand the scriptures that he must rise from the dead. And the disciples returned to their homes. You know, they, they didn't understand. It obviously didn't sink in. They scattered. I don't want to compare them to to, to, to rats on the ship scattering, but they do. They do. There was only one disciple that was with Jesus at the crucifixion. And that fellow was so young, he probably didn't know any better. It's John. But the rest of them were doing different things. Some, the scriptures that went home. Some went to the upper room. Some went to Emmaus. Some go back to Galilee to start fishing. Who knows? Some may have gone back to their tax tables. We don't know. They scattered. But there's Mary. There's Mary. First day of the week, coming to the tomb, weeping. Initially, she's weeping in sadness and in tragedy, but those tears turn into tears of triumph. Why was she weeping? We'll deal with that in just, just, just a few short minutes here. We're going to deal with why she was weeping. She was weeping because she had lost someone she loved. Wouldn't you? If you lose someone you love. It's been said that no experience in life is more universal than tears. I believe that, but not everyone can shed a tear. But here's one fact. There's nothing more universal than death. We're hearing all kinds of statistics today with the coronavirus. All kinds of them. All kinds of models and projections. And some of them are not very pleasant. We may not, we don't know where we are in the projection of what's going to happen. But here's a statistic that's even more, even more tragic than that. One out of one is going to die. Every one of us. It's appointed unto each and every one of us to die. And after this, the judgment. Now how we deal with death? Well, C.S. Lewis, 
married late in life. And he, his wife was a Jewish lady that converted to Christianity because she was reading his books and was so impressed with, with Christianity. She becomes a Christian. Her name was Joy. And when Joy dies, C.S. Lewis was so broken. He said, I never knew love could hurt so much. He was like Mary Magdalene weeping. Love does hurt in separation. If, uh, if you're not experiencing or do not experience it firsthand, sooner or later it's going to happen to someone you do love. My dad's 96 years old and I'm keeping with him, with up, up with him through this pandemic in his uh, assisted living home. But can you imagine in 96 years all of the deaths he's experienced and seen? He has no parents anymore. They're gone. He has no uh, uh, brothers or sisters anymore. He was the youngest. They're all gone. We, even when we're not dealing with our own mortality and in this life we have to deal with the death of others and those that, that we love. George Burns, the comedian, in his book entitled How to Live to Be a Hundred or More said the way you do this is stay away from funerals and especially your own. But here's something really neat about the Burns. He, he also said nothing is more sure than death and taxes. He said you might be able to avoid taxes for a while, but you will certainly not be able to avoid death. That your own or someone you love. He had also a, a person that worked with him. Her name was Gracie Allen. They were never married, but they were just real close and they were working partners all through their career. Burns and Allen. They worked through radio, television, movies. And when Gracie died, it was very difficult for George Burns to deal with it. It just broke his heart, as you can imagine. His, his, his uh, working partner for his entire career. And he'd go to the cemetery. He'd go every day or so. And he would spend time just talking to Gracie. And one day, a person asked him, Do you think... Gracie hears you when you talk to her. Burns answered by saying, I don't know if she hears me or not. Or not. But why not? Why not? I thought that was a real good answer. Why not? You know, death. Whether it happens after, it happened 50 years ago or whether it happened five days ago or five minutes ago. It's universal. It's a universal loss. It happens to children. Adults, teenagers, sooner or later, we all are confronted with our own mortality or those that we love. That's one of the reasons she was crying. She lost someone she loved. Another reason she was weeping is that she did not fully understand the grandeur of what, of grandeur of what was happening. She had, didn't fully understand the gospel. Why? Because the gospel, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John had not been written. She, we have the luxury of looking at the scripture and understanding it. She was living it uh, firsthand. She thought she was standing beside the tomb of someone who was dead. And the paradox of the story is she was standing by the tomb of someone who was dead. Now, now this is very important also. Don't let anyone take away from the drama that's unfolding here, the death. Don't let anyone tell you that it was a uh, suspended uh, coma or, or, or he was going through something that uh, uh, just uh, uh, slowing the heart rate. Or, don't let anyone fool you or tell you that. He was dead. Stone cold dead. We need to remember that and profess that because... That's important to the story of the resurrection. Without the death, there could be no resurrection. But Mary Magdalene, possibly now she starts remembering, yes, he did say that in three days he would come back. He did speak of the resurrection, but somehow...
she had forgotten. Or it had not become a reality. Karl Barth, one of the great theologians of the 20th century, said that one of the reasons we go to church on Easter Sunday, now that's a neat statement to make right now, when I'm here, pretty much of an empty church, you can hear the echo. It reminds me of what the true church is, doesn't it, you? We love this building. We love all the people that worked and sacrificed and saved so that this building could be here. The stones, the mortar, the paint, all that goes into making this church the building that it is. But this pandemic has reminded us what the true church is and where you are right now. And you're truly in the church. You are the church. So, Karl Barth said one of the reasons we go to church on Easter, as you're participating right now in church, is to ask the question, is it true? Is this true? Many people are weeping because they've not asked the question or answered the question. Many people are lost today because they've not realized that it is true. Like Pilate asked, what is truth? Many people go through the rituals, go through the motions, but somehow the power of the gospel has not been experienced. Somehow they're acting like the disciples were acting right up to the resurrection. They understood. Here's a good assignment for you during your time at home with the... Uh, uh, dealing with this, 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 this distancing and uh, study the, the definition of the historical Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ the Savior. It's very important. They're the same person but very, very different. This is how different they are. Many people know about God. I would say about 100% of the people on earth know about God. But not everybody knows God. I would say about 99.9% .9 of the people of the earth know about the historical Jesus Christ. Know that a man did live called Jesus of Nazareth and walked those dusty streets and roads of Palestine in the first century named Jesus. But not everybody knows Jesus Christ, the Savior. There's a difference. Many people go through the motions and the rituals, but somehow they've not experienced the risen Christ. E. Stanley Jones, he was actually talking about war when he made this statement, but he could be talking about war, famine, pestilence, natural disasters, coronavirus. He said... He didn't grieve long over the awful events of life because he knew how they were going to turn out. God is in control and Christ lives. That's, that's a pretty good quote. By the grace of God, the tombs, the tomb and the tombs, yours and mine, will turn into a light at the end of the tunnel. Now Mary well, before she encountered the risen Christ, she well and tragedy. After she encounters the risen Christ, she weeps in triumph. Christ is alive. Now here's an amazing part of the story. This is what the whole message is leading up to. It's amazing in the gospel how very little impact the life of the historical Jesus had on his followers. Think about it. Those disciples particularly. It's amazing how little impact it had on them. The, we opened, up, opened our service up by saying how no one ever lived who was greater, more compassionate, more giving, more loving. And they were first-handed. 
experience this loving, kind, generous, historical Jesus Christ. So it's amazing how little impact it had on them. What was how little, how little was it? Well, how many of them were there at the crucifixion? How many of them responded at the resurrection? They go back home, the scripture tells us. They go to the upper room. They go to Emmaus. They go back to Galilee to start fishing again. They go their own merry way. Jesus was the greatest teacher who ever lived. That was not enough. He was the greatest healer who ever lived. That was not enough. He was the greatest compassionate thinker that ever lived, but that was not enough. If Jesus had ended this with his life, his teachings, his passion, his death, and the cross, as powerful as the cross is, according to verse 10, then the disciples returned to their homes. If it had ended just with the crucifixion, as, as powerful as it was, the blood of Christ and the cross, they would have gone home. What makes the difference? The experience of the risen Christ transformed that community of doubters, unbelievers, fearful men and women into a group of people that turned the world upside down. We can say this is the beginning of the New Testament if you want to, but it's, there are so many places in the New Testament that you might say this is, this is part of it. Everything changes now and from now on. The historical Christ is dead and gone. Jesus Christ the Savior is alive forever. Here's something. I've been accused of being judgmental a few times and if I am, then so be it. This may be a judgmental statement, but it's so true. You can't say I'm a Christian and not believe in the resurrection. You can't say I'm a Christian and not believe in Easter. You can say anything you want to. You can say, oh, I believe in his wonderful teachings and I believe in that good person. But you're asking me to accept somebody that was dead coming back to life and uh, I, I won't accept that. Well, then you can't be a Christian. Because none other than the Apostle Paul, the greatest theologian who ever lived, addressed this subject. He never had a chance to meet Jesus in the flesh like the disciples did. One well, of the difference between disciples and apostles. But no one knew more about Christ or as much about Christ as Paul. He understood the life, the death, the burial, the resurrection. And Paul understood it so clearly that nothing would be more important than the blood and the cross and the sacrifice of Christ. It's the very heart of everything that we believe. But if that's the heart of it, Paul would say the very soul of our Christian faith is the resurrection. i give you a good example as we conclude this Easter service. It's my favorite verse of Scripture in the Bible. It's Romans 10, 9. These are the words of the great Apostle Paul. I use these, this scripture all the time in witnessing and talking to people. Actually, this passage of scripture helped in my conversion. It's about Easter. Romans 10, 9. It's also about how to be saved. If there's any doubt, any question in your mind or heart, you might ought to check that passage out. It goes like this. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth, the Lord Jesus Christ. And believe in thy heart that God raised Jesus from the dead. That's the Easter story. You believe that. Confession with the mouth, believing in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Now if I said now, in other words, Jesus meant this, 
I would be foolish because there are no other words that could describe salvation any clearer than that. And how important being people of the Easter faith is to us. That it's the very soul of who we are and what we are as Christians. We confess Jesus with our mouths. I am a Christian. And we believe with our hearts. The scripture goes on there and the other verses that follow with a mouth man confesses with a heart person believes. But it's the Easter story. It's the very essence and very heart of who we are. Yeah, Mary cries as she approaches on that Easter Sunday morning. Tears of tragedy. But as she leaves, she's crying tears of triumph. The blood is the very heart of the gospel. The resurrection, the Easter story, is the very soul of the gospel and who we are. Confession with the mouth, believe in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead. Thou shalt be saved. It doesn't get any clearer, plainer, and more direct than that. May God bless you. Let's have our closing and invitation.
for what you've done for us. We ask your blessings on those that are suffering and sick even as we speak. Help us to dedicate ourselves to you and your service here on this earth. And thank you that we are allowed, we've allowed, been allowed to experience another wonderful Easter. In your name we pray and give thanks. Amen.